our New Testament reading and preaching text can be found in John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. Those of you that are with us live in the service, you can follow along in your pew Bible on New Testament page 113. John 18, 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of the Lord. So after graduation, one of my friends became a missionary to Haiti. And while she was over there, her parents decided, we want to go over and see what life's like for our daughter, make sure that she's safe. Um, So they headed over to visit her. And this was back in the uh, late 80s, I mean, late 70s, early 80s, uh, when things were a little different than they are today. And um, there's a little bit of backstory that you need to understand to understand this story. My friend is from Holland, Michigan. And uh, her grandfather was an immigrant uh, from Holland. And Holland is this place in America that has this really high Dutch identity. It's really common, especially back in her day, to still hear Dutch phrases used around town and things like that. There's this high, high Dutch identity of who they are. So on the day my friend's parents were to arrive, she goes to the airport, and again, late 70s, early 80s, airports were a lot more open than they are now. And she got to stand right outside the door at customs and see her parents come off the plane and go through customs. And there were several tables there, and um, she saw them walk up to the table, and she saw others walk up to the other tables. And after a while, they were still there. And everybody else had moved through several times. And she was wondering, what is going on? So she yells in at her dad. And she said, Dad, what's taking so long? And he turns around and sees his daughter for the first time and has this strange look on his face. And he said, they're saying that something's wrong with our passports. And she goes, what's wrong with your passport? And he goes, I don't know. He goes, the guy asked me where I was from. And he said, I'm Dutch. And I said, I'm Dutch. And she looks at him and goes, Dad, you're not Dutch, you're an American. And she said, actually, thinking back, she said, if, I, if my dad would have realized that he'd have to say he wasn't Dutch to get in Haiti, he probably would not have come and seen me. How do you understand your identity? How do you think about who you are at your deepest levels and your sense of soul? And how does that identity live out in the way you understand yourself, in the decisions you make, and in how you direct your life? When I think about this scene in Scripture, I realize this week that I have a problem. I try to sanitize this scene a lot. Do you do this? So I have this uh, habit of seeing Jesus innocent until proven guilty, requested to come in for a chat. I forget that Jesus has already been slapped around by the high priest. I minimize the fact that he probably was violently dragged in and thrown on the ground before this governor that answers to no one in this country. Pilate's a person who could make any decision about Jesus' well-being, his torture or his release, his life or his death, 
at any moment. Anybody who was under Roman authority understood this explicitly. This is how life was. But we, looking at this 2,000 years later, have to remind ourselves of what it was like back then so that we can understand all the dynamics in the story. Rome has set up a structure in this part of the world. Herod the Great defeated the empire of the Parthians 30 years before Jesus was born. And in gratitude, Rome allowed Herod to become king of the Jews, although he had no ethnic or ancestral claim to that title. And we see Pilate walk into this scene. As the Roman governor, he likely cares for what Rome cares about and doesn't bother with things that aren't on Rome's radar. Rome typically cares about two things. The first one, pay your taxes. Now we have to say, wow, some things never change, right? The second one is, don't be a pain in Rome's backside. Pilate would likely completely ignore the inter-ethnic conflicts between what he sees as this weird people group. But into this situation, into this reality, we are witnesses to this conversation. And as Pilate walks into this scene, his only care is that he heard someone say, this is someone who claims to be the king of the Jews. Because if people are rallying around this understanding, it could lead to a revolt or even a revolution. And Rome would care deeply about that. But recognize who lays before Pilate. Jesus is just a guy from the wrong part of the country. And really, he only has a few followers and they've all abandoned him now. He has no wealth. This guy is no threat. And even though the interaction will be calming to Pilate, it sets up a lot for us to understand. A governor like Pilate would always want to know about threats that are on the horizon. In asking Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? He's asking him, are you going to lead a rebellion against Rome? Pilate gets to experience the frustration that often comes from asking Jesus questions. Jesus answers him with a question of his own. Now, one thing that I've always liked to do with this scene and others is I like to imagine that the disciples were there. They were not there in this case. But when Pilate asks Jesus a question and Jesus replies with another question, I think the disciples would go, yeah, that's how he does. It's really frustrating. But Jesus' question asks Pilate, do you care about the answer to this question? Or is that just somebody else's question that you're parroting? Pilate is putting up with a lot. He's going in and going out of the building that he's talking with Jesus. And outside the Jewish, sorry about that. And outside, he has to meet with the Jewish hierarchy. Because they're unwilling to come in the building because Passover is real soon, and it's going to make them ceremonially unclean. Pilate's answer, I'm not a Jew, am I, shows that like Rome, he really doesn't care about what's going on behind the scenes. He doesn't care about this intercultural um, squabbling that's going on. All he cares about is that here and now, He's making sure that there is no credible threat to Rome. And in frustration, he goes back at Jesus saying, what have you done? This time, Jesus answers what is at the core of Pilate's worries. But notice, as often is, his, his answer didn't answer Pilate's question. His, Jesus says to him, my kingdom is not from this world. In talking about this passage, the theologian N.T. Wright wants us to make sure we understand what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is not saying. Jesus isn't saying his kingdom is otherworldly. 
that it exists out there and isn't affected by what goes on here, that he doesn't care about what's going on. If it was otherworldly, it could be completely separate and just let what happens on earth happen and it's going to do its thing. But Jesus is denying that his kingdom originates from this world, the place where sin and evil come from. Jesus' kingdom doesn't have all these problems. Jesus' kingdom isn't another like all the other ones with crises and issues and corruption. Jesus' kingdom is coming to solve all those problems. And Wright says it's important for us to understand that Jesus' kingdom is for this world, not of this world. And as a defense of this claim, Jesus appeals to what Pilate knows. If this kingdom was of this world, my people would be fighting to sustain it. There's a huge tradition in Judaism at this time of rebellion. There have been several rebellions prior and to and since Roman occupation. At times, different groups of Jews have risen up taken up weapons, and fought against those that they saw as their oppressors. Jesus is saying, if my people had that goal, you would have already seen evidence of it. And then Jesus repeats, my kingdom is not from here. What does it mean to Jesus and to us that his kingdom is not from here? It means the source of his power as a king doesn't come from anything on this earth. Not armies or wealth or political power. Jesus' source, his identity, his power, who he is, comes from a place that at this point is beyond this world. It allows Jesus to care for our world, to work for its betterment, but also to make decisions about what he will engage and what he will not. Because what happens here never limits what he's about or what he can bring forth. He doesn't rely on what takes place on this earth. Several years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he and I have a lot of similarities, and we have a few differences. And one of the interesting things about us is that even though we have all these similarities, who we understand ourselves to be at our core is one of the few differences between us. And so I kind of naively asked him, hey, why is this thing, that this difference between us, why is that the place where you put your primary identity? And he said, people tend to identify with what they are most persecuted for. As we see all the fights and tension in our country, a lot can be boiled down to feeling like who I am is under attack. But how do you fix that? In a way, Jesus is saying things that make Pilate believe that he's no threat to Rome. From Pilate's perspective, a threat is all about swords and spears and other weaponry. Jesus doesn't check any of the boxes that Pilate worries about. But if he could really understand he would see at least two things. First of all, there is nothing that threatens more Rome more than the kingdom Jesus is bringing about. This is the kingdom that will eventually bring all others to an end. It's the kingdom that works against all injustice and evil in every time and every place. It is the source and power that fans the flame of good in all the world. But the completion of its mission is not dependent on its followers picking a fight. The second thing that Pilate would realize is that even if he understood this, there's nothing he could do to stop it. There is no army or group that he could overpower, even with all of Rome's might. There are no weapons that he could exploit, no leader that he can take down. No one has the power to do anything to this kingdom that this kingdom doesn't allow them to do. Jesus tells him the truth. I'm a king, and everyone that belongs to my truth listens to my voice. How much of this truth has settled into what we believe? 
What are the signs that may indicate that we have some more work to do in believing in this kingdom, in this truth, and this king? Lynn and I were with some friends at a restaurant several years ago, and it was a restaurant with these tiny little tables, and we were all packed in like sardines, and you know, you could hear conversations at all of the tables around you. We were there with uh, a couple that are some friends of ours, and a table right near our table was having a political discussion, and the political discussion was of a different uh, variety than the couple that we were with uh, ascribed to. And after a while, the guy that was with us, the guy and the couple, he started making comments on the, the discussion that was going on next to us. And as it went on and on, uh, after a while, nothing that was going on our table was really sinking in. He was getting more and more fixated on the conversation next to us. And as you can imagine, it was getting really awkward and um, strange. And so after a while, we said, you know, it's, it's probably time to go. Let's, let's get out of here. And as we're getting up to leave, this guy leans over to the other table and just goes off on him. Our world has a ton of problems. But are the things that get, get us wound up things that would have gotten Jesus wound up? Jesus and the kingdom he was establishing would ignore a lot of things that we probably take too seriously. There are real problems facing our world that we need to be involved in. We need to act and try to get control of. But when we demonstrate that we are threatened by things that wouldn't even make Jesus radar, we show that our source is not the same source of the king that we claim that our identity is in something far less solid. So this is Thanksgiving week. Many of us are going to find ourselves at tables with family and friends that see life very differently than we do. Ask yourself, what are they going to hear? Who are they going to hear is our trust and our hope? What do we follow? Which kingdom are they going to see in how we respond? The one Jesus comes from or the one whose power and time is much, much less? Let us pray. Sovereign God, our King, come to us now displaying your holy power. Still our distracted minds, our bruised hearts, our longing bodies. Develop in us care for your kingdom and its purposes and take from us those things that do not belong in your kingdom. We continue to fight for things that do not matter and ignore a host of things that you came to upend. Do work in our hearts and souls, Lord Jesus. We lift up those in our congregation that are going through things. Pour out your care upon them. Do your healing work in their bodies, minds, and souls. We ask you to bring this pandemic to an end, to protect even some from themselves. Give us the will to do your kingdom work and the grace that we may accomplish it. With you in Christ and through the Holy Spirit on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Church Sundays at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary or live streamed on our website.